Physics Lecture 9, Light and Optics. Let's start with the fundamentals. Electromagnetic waves are stated as transverse waves. This is because the electric and magnetic field vectors are perpendicular to the propagation. The electromagnetic spectrum defines and describes the full range of frequencies and wavelengths of electromagnetic waves. The speed of light is noted as C, or speed of light, equals frequency times lambda. It comes out to be about 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's definitely a value you're going to want to memorize, because that value is going to be used in quite a few calculations. The visible range is noted as what we can see. So if you've heard of Roy G. Biv, that's talking about the visible range. If you look at, an actual, at the actual electromagnetic spectrum, you'll note that the visible spectrum is a very small portion of the entire spectrum. It makes you kind of wonder how much of the real world we're taking in, doesn't it? Black body. This is an ideal absorber that absorbs all wavelengths, hence it appears black. It states that there is no light that gets out of it or reflects back. For the rest of the lecture, we're going to talk about geometric optics, in particular mirrors and lenses. Before we begin though, let's go into reflection. Reflection stated is the rebounding of incident light waves at the boundary of a medium, and it's governed by the law of reflection, which is noted below. In a system with a reflection, so if I have the surface here, we have what's called the normal, or a line like so. This is stated as the normal. We'll have an incident ray and a resulting ray that is reflected off. This angle right here is noted as theta 1, and this one is noted as theta 2. Speaking of reflection, let's go into mirrors, a very classic form of reflection. In mirrors, the images can be either real or virtual. An image is real when the light actually converges at the position of the image. A virtual image, on the other hand, is if the light only appears to be coming from the image. When most people think about mirrors, what they're thinking about are plane mirrors or flat mirrors. In this case, the image will always be virtual. So keep, take note of that because the other mirrors aren't going to be as straightforward. The mirrors that are likely going to be tested on the MCAT are going to be spherical mirrors, and there are two kinds. Concave mirrors, or converging mirrors, are bowed away from the observer, whereas convex mirrors are bowed towards the observer. Examples of these two are listed below. Take note that there are ray diagrams for both of these. You're going to understand you're going to need to know how to draw these and how to interpret these if you are going to be successful come test day. There are a couple equations that you will need to know to, to understand mirrors. The first is the focal length. The focal length is listed as the distance between the focal point and the mirror. And the equation is listed below. Magnification. Magnification, as the name would suggest, is, well, when you blow an image up or shrink it. It's a dimensionless value as the ratio of the image distance to the object distance. If the image is inverted, that means the magnification has a negative value. If it's upright, it's positive. Here are some sign conventions when you're dealing with mirrors. To the left, there's the symbol or the value, and then whether it's positive or negative. That will indicate which, what scenario is actually occurring. Take note of these and make sure you know what a positive or a negative value means for each variable. Before we begin on lenses, I think it's important to talk about refraction first. Refraction is stated as the bending of light as it passes from one medium to another. If you've ever gone swimming before, you'll notice that when something is submerged underwater, it looks different than when it comes up. So if I were to stick my feet in the water, you're going to notice that you observe the feet to be in a different position than they actually are. This is because of the refraction of the sunlight against the pool. Refraction is governed by Snell's Law, which is listed below. 
Snell's law is listed as n equals c over v, or c as the speed of light in a vacuum over v, which is the speed of light in a medium. n is a dimensionless quality called the index of refraction of the medium. Each medium has a unique index of refraction, and this is how we calculate it. The refracted rays of light are observed as n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. That's from going from one medium to the other. At the bottom, let me draw out a system to illustrate this. So I've got my boundary between the mediums and my normal. If I have an incident ray, like so, it's going to have a refracted ray. This is going to be noted as my theta 2 and my theta 1, which makes this n1 and n2. An example of this would be if we were to look from the water up into the air. So if we had water as our n1 and air as our n2. This is one example of how light will bend as it passes from medium to medium. You'll know a couple, you'll know a couple trends though. From Snell's law, we can state that when light enters a medium with a higher index of refraction, that is, n2 being greater than n1, it'll bend towards the normal. Whereas, if the index of refraction is smaller, that is, n2 being less than n1, the light will bend away from the normal. The total internal refraction is based around the critical angle. The critical angle is reached when the refracted angle theta 2 equals 90 degrees. At the critical angle, the refracted light passes along the interface between the two media, and it can be derived from Snell's law by listing theta 2 as 90 degrees. The manipulation is listed below. This results in a phenomenon in which the all light incident on a boundary is reflected back into the original material. Now that we've covered refraction, let's go into the second bit of our lecture, lenses be very careful with lenses. They are similar to mirrors in almost every way. However, the side conventions are different. There are also convex and concave lenses, which are listed at the bottom right. However, the math for this and the side conventions are all starkly different. There is a new equation that we're going to have to cover, though, when we're talking about lenses, and that's the lens maker's equation. The variables are listed as n being the index of refraction of the lens materials, r1 being the radius of curvature of the first lens, and r2 being the radius of the curvature of the second lens. Here are the sign conventions for the lenses. You'll notice that some of the positive and negative values are not the same as mirrors. As I stated earlier, make sure you understand which is which and what conventions to use for lenses and for mirrors. There does exist systems in which multiple lenses are, can be placed into a row. An example is listed below. As you note, you can, you can stack mirrors that are convex and concave. It'll just alter the calculation. Before we talk about multiple lens systems, though, let's go into what power means. Power is measured in diopters, and it's listed as P equals 1 over F. P, therefore, has the same sign as F, which means that it's positive for converging lenses and negative for diverging lenses. Let's, kinda, let's equate this to glasses. People who are nearsighted need diverging lenses, whereas people who are farsighted need converging lenses. When we talk about bifocals, these have two distinct regions, one that converges light to correct farsightedness, and the second area that causes divergence of light to correct for nearsightedness. This is a way to, to account for both of these issues in the same lens. Now that we've covered power, let's go into lens systems proper. Focal length is listed as the sum of the reciprocals, so the total focal length is listed below. Power is also additive, much like the focal length. Note, though, that magnification is the product of each lens. If you've ever stacked magnifying glasses in a row, you'll notice that the change noted in the magnification is quite a bit more than just something that would be additive. Light and optics does have a couple situations that cause errors. 
These specific types of errors are noted as aberrations. The first aberration we'll go into are, is a spherical aberration. This is a blurring of light that is around the periphery of an image, which is a result of inadequate reflection of parallel beams at the edge of a mirror, or inadequate refraction of parallel beams at the edge of the lens. This creates an area of multiple images with very slightly different image distances at the edge of the image, and it'll appear blurry. Chromatic aberrations, on the other hand, have a dispersive effect within a spherical lens. This leads to the splitting and dispersion of wavelengths and a presence of rainbow colors around an image. Anytime you've looked at something that's been soaking wet in really bright sunlight, you'll notice that there is a halo or some sort of corona of rainbow color around it. That's chromatic aberration at work. As a lens maker, these are two aberrations that must be accounted for when making glasses or other magnification equipment. Dispersion. This is when various wavelengths of, lights, of light separate from each other. If you've seen the cover of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, that's an example of dispersion, and it's listed below. Light is incident on a surface, and it is split into all of its r respective wavelengths. Now that we've covered lenses and mirrors, along with a couple issues that you may run into, especially with lenses, let's go into what diffraction is. Diffraction is a spreading out of light as it passes through a narrow opening, or an obstacle. Note that diffraction can occur when it goes through multiple narrow openings or obstacles as well. An example is listed at, at the bottom. A diffraction system can be noted as a slit lens system, with the equation listed as a sine theta equals n lambda. a is the width of the slit theta being the angle between the line drawn from the center of the lens to the dark fringes, and n being an integer indicating the number of fringes, lambda being the wavelength of incident light. You'll note, as the light goes through these narrow openings, it, re it retains a pattern similar to the source, but if there's multiple slits, it's going to create a slightly different situation. When it comes to multiple slits, you have to take into account the position of minima, which is noted as d sine theta equals n plus one half times lambda. d is noted as the distance between the two slits, theta being the angle drawn between the midpoint of the two slits to the dark fringes in the normal, n being the number of fringes, and lambda as the wavelength of the incident wave. Make sure you understand that bright fringes are halfway between these dark fringes. Take note of that. The last thing we're going to go into in our lecture today is polarization. Plain polarized light is light in which the electric fields of all the waves are oriented in the same direction. The most common use you're going to see on the MCAT is when you're dealing with stereoisomers, or specific rotation. This is a way in which you calculate and determine optical activity, which is decided by the chirality of the molecule in question. If you recall from organic chemistry, remember that enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images, and they will have different specific rotations. That's one way you can use plain polarized light to distinguish enantiomers from each other. Chirality is based around the fact that depending on the functional groups, they'll rotate in a specific way and polarize light in one way or another. These are all ways to help us identify organic compounds. Another example you might see when it comes to plain polarized light is asking how much or what percentage of light is going to get through a polarizing system. So for example, if I have light that goes through a filter oriented like so, I may only get about half of it to come through. Well, if I go through another system that's filtered like so, in the opposite direction, I've already lost all of the light that's polarized in this direction from the first obstacle. Therefore, I should expect to see no light going through. Note that you may have slight angles or deviations from this, but that's one example of a way that polarization will cancel out light. There you go. We're almost through the physics portion. Hang in there, and we'll see you in the next lecture.